Please join me as we go before the throne. Dear Lord, thank you so very, very much. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this week. Thank you for all that you've done between the last time we were here together and now. Dear Lord, thank you for the praise reports. Thanks for Deb's sister. She's she's not in the... It's, they were worried about the respirator before. thought there she was bound to be on it for sure, and she's on the BiPAP instead, dear Lord. And, and Lord, just the, the health... For her, dear Lord, we ask that you continue to have that team of care, that care team around her, continue to hear your voice, continue to follow your, follow your promptings, dear Lord, that they would, they would do what you desire for them to do, with her and and help her and guide her and and Lord, just continue to to lift her up to you. Also, dear Lord, uh, Cole, we uh, we raise Cole up to you, Cole's. Uh, you know better than we do uh, the tumor, the seizures, all that, dear Lord. A lot of uncertainty, a lot of struggle. Um, dear Lord, we just ask that you would help him, help his family also, dear Lord, um, that, that they, would, they would fight and fight well going through this, dear Lord, and that uh, um, they would turn to you when they're struggling, that they would turn to you, dear Lord. They would come to, to, uh, uh, to your feet, dear Lord. Um, Lord, we ask that you would lead the care team around him as well, dear Lord, that they would hear your voice, they would hear your prompting, they would feel your spirit move them, and that they would do what it is you move them to do. Dear Lord, that uh, uh, we, we raise up um, Glenna's brother, uh, Terry, to you um, with that heart valve and, and his health issues. Dear Lord, we just ask that you have your hand on, on him and, and all those around him. Dear Lord, we ask that uh, you would lead, you would guide uh, that care team as well. We ask that you lead and guide Terry and his family, dear Lord. And we ask that you lead and glide, guide Glenna and Don as, as their whatever it is they can do whether prayer obviously lord but but also in in any other aspect that they can help out or or be of assistance or maybe have the right word to speak dear lord because we man we just don't know know what to say sometimes we just we just we just don't get it we don't understand and and when we're going through some of this stuff and and so lord i just ask that you help each and every one of them to understand that you're there for them that you're waiting for them to turn to you to come to you to meet you at your feet dear lord and dear Lord, we just ask that you would help them to, to open up to you, that they would hear you. Dear Lord, we ask that as, as this message is delivered today, dear Lord, we're, we're going we're gonna to do some plowing today. And Father, I just ask that as we talk about uh, our view of sin and revisit our view of sin and rethink our view of sin, dear Lord, that, that Lord, we would, we would open our hearts to it and we would grasp what's here before us today. As we struggle with it, many of us, all of us struggle with sin, all of us struggle with sin. Many of us might be struggling with some of what we talk about today. Lord, I just ask that you help each and every one of us to, to open up to that and to receive what you have for us today. Father, I just ask that uh, you would you would continue to lead and guide me. That I would I would be the shepherd that you desire for me to be. I would be the the pastor that you desire for me to be. And that I'd be, I'd be the conduit that you desire for me to be. Lord, I, that that I can be there when when you desire for me to be, and I will know what to do and what to say and how to share and how to love, dear Lord. And how most of all that each and every one of us would know how to reflect you and your Son to the world that we're in. So as we walk through this message on sin, I just ask you help each of us to become a clearer, better, stronger, more powerful reflection of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you in advance for all that you're going to do through this day, this message, and throughout our lives as we move forward and we walk out of this building with this message. Dear Lord, I thank you so very much for what you're going to do. I look forward to seeing your hand work through this. And Father, we come to you with the prayer that your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And I also want to raise up a prayer to uh, Lord for Todd. Todd's out traveling and and uh, he's on he's he's on the road, and just ask that you give him travel mercies, uh, dear Lord, that you would watch over him and protect him 
in this time as well. And we just pray that in your loving son, Jesus' name also. Amen. That's what happens when you write it on your hand and you don't have it in your notes. That's what happens. So um, that's what that says. <laughs> so um, anyway, anyway, uh, so, so we're going to start out today. I, I, I'm going to ask you a few biblical questions today, okay? Um, are we ready for some questions? Were you ready for the quiz? Did everyone study? You know that quiz I didn't tell you about? Check this out, huh? What did Daniel tell his real estate agent? I never said there were going to be serious Bible questions. What did Daniel tell his real estate agent? I prefer a house without a den. <laughs> Daniel, the lion's den, that thing. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, so, so <laughs> oh, it gets better. Um, so w which b biblical character was the best musician? Samson, he brought the house down. So you're welcome, you're welcome, I'm here all week. Um, so what, what did the classmates say when they, when they were asked why they kept walking next to the same person at school? I was told to walk by faith. She's faith. <laughs> what kind of car would Jesus drive? Y'all got to get this one. A Chrysler. Come on now. <laughs> all right. Okay, last one, I promise. The last one. What did, uh, what did, Pirates call Noah's boat. The ark. And all God's people said, Arg, get over it, right? So um, I never said they were going to be serious. We like to laugh, don't we? We like to have fun. We joke around a little bit. It's a good time. And I find right before I get serious with people, it's good to make them laugh a little bit. So it's okay. Even if they go, that's the worst bad dad joke I ever heard. So it's okay. But we laugh at a lot of things, don't we? You remember the, the, the show that was on TV, home, uh, Funniest Home Videos, right? Used to love watching that until it got way too personal, right? Because suddenly they had highlights every week of somebody, get, some guys getting hit in certain regions by certain objects, and it just caused pain and trauma, and my PTSD kicked in from my youth. And so I, I quit watching that. But, we're, right, we watched it all the time. It was fun. It was so cool to watch all that stuff happen. We had, um, what about, what we laugh when we go to t-ball games, don't we? Check this out, right? So, so whose kids are these, right? Because they're bound to be someone's kids in here, right? I mean, the, you go to the t-ball game, and they're, they're supposed to be out. This is the outfielder, and little sis came out to help him play outfield, right? And so, you know, we, but we, you're sitting there, mom and dad are sitting there just laughing and going, oh, that's my kid, you know? Or, or maybe mom's saying, that's my kid. Dad's going, that's not my kid. <laughs> you know what I mean? But... Uh, um, how about uh, memes? We laugh at memes all the time, or, or as I like to call them, memes. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, you know, it's a, and, and I wanted a scriptural one, so um, it was pretty cool. Um, and how about, how about, have you ever laughed at someone when they're dancing? Have you ever laughed at people dancing? <laughs> I've had a lot of people laugh at me when I was dancing. Um, check this out, right? So this is... When you think nobody's watching, right? You think no one's watching, I can do it, right? I'm just hoping I can dance that good when I get to be his age. It'll be a good time, right? You ask my wife, I don't dance well. <laughs> Slow dance, that's it. <laughs> Anything else is embarrassing for her, okay? So um, I used to think I could dance like Elvis. <laughs> that was back when I drank. And um, so, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, it's great for us to laugh, and we want to laugh, and we should laugh. God created us. He, he wants us to enjoy life, right? We should be able to laugh. But what's sad is that we've come to a place where we laugh at sin. And we laugh about sin. And we think it's okay that sin's funny somehow. And as we continue on, we're going we're gonna to get a little close to the corn this week. Okay? We're going to do a little close plowing. It's going to be okay, though. Now, I don't want you to raise your hand, but how, how, many, how many people... Answer in your heart, how many people laughed at someone be who was bigger than we felt they should be or smaller, skinnier than we thought they should be? How many of us, we, we've laughed at someone just because we felt bad about ourselves, so we just want to make ourselves feel better, and by putting someone else down, mocking somebody else, it would make us feel better about ourselves somehow? How many of us have laughed at someone with a disability made fun of the way they walked, the way they talked, the way they acted. The problem is this. When it comes to sin, we're the only ones laughing because God's not. 
God's not laughing about it. It's not funny to him. And no matter what we do to try to justify, we make all kinds of excuses, don't we? Not my fault, I'm human. Just going to happen. And we use an excuse to just continue on doing what we continue on to do. But God's not laughing. He's not laughing with us. He's not laughing at us. He's not laughing at all while we're sinning. Would you laugh at the cross? Is there ever a time you can think of that you would laugh at the cross? Because Jesus was that serious about sin. He was that serious about you and me that he went to that cross for us. Romans 5, verse 12 th- uh, through 21 uh, says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way came to all people because all sinned. Who sinned? All sinned. Because all sinned. Verse 15 says, But the gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Jesus Christ, what he did was for each and every one of us, not just the one. Not just one here and there, not just the ones we choose to let. That's, that's the one we sh- he should be should have went to the cross for, but for any, or for all, I mean. Verse 20 says that the law was brought, to, brought in so the trespass might increase. But, wherein, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Christ, uh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Righteousness and eternal life Jesus brought to us. I'm going to share four things that we need to know about sin, and as we do, uh, like I say, we're going to get close to the corn. It might it might hurt a little bit, okay? Um, and I guarantee you there's some things we're going to talk about that's really close to the corn for me. I'm saddened. The reason, I, the reason I'm so serious about this is because I'm saddened that the fact that we think sin is funny. We think it's okay. We think it's all right. Let's just make excuses. Oh, it's okay. It don't matter. God will forgive me. We minimize sin. Everyone else is doing it. And that saddens me. And what saddens me even worse than that is the church today. The church today, I say, encourages it. Because the church today makes excuses for people all the time, too. The church today, far too often, the church today, they, they might point out this sin or that sin, but to the church today, as we see all the time in the news, oh, this is okay now, and that's okay now, and the other thing's okay now. Church today is leading people straight to hell, as I've shared with you before. And that breaks my heart. So we're going to spend some time. We're going to be talking about, uh, um, we're going to talk about Jesus, and we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, and we're going to talk about sin. And when we get close to the corn, I'm not going to apologize to you for it. Because I don't believe we should. Jesus wouldn't. He didn't hang on that cross and go, oh, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to offend you, but I'm going to hang here for you. I don't, I don't believe we should. So that's why we, we're, we're going to rethink sin this week. And we're going to hopefully be able to come to understand it a little better. Because I think a lot of people just don't get how serious sin really is. How big a deal it really is. Who, 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 who has fallen short? Who has fallen short in sin? All, right? What's, what's the wages of sin? Exactly. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. So the number one, sin is the opposite of God. Something we need to understand is sin is the opposite of God. See, man calls sin an accident, but God calls it an abomination. Man calls sin a defect, but God calls it a disease. Man calls sin an error, but God calls it an enmity. Man calls sin a liberty, but God calls it lawlessness. Man calls sin a trifle, God calls it a tragedy. Man calls sin a mistake, but God calls it madness. Man calls sin weakness, but God calls it willfulness. Whatever you want to call it, however you want to justify it, whatever excuse you want to make for it, God hates it. God hates sin. God will have nothing to do with sin. God's the total opposite of sin. People say God 
God, the uh, Bible tells us that, that God hates sin, loves the sinner. Well, if that's the case, then explain to me Sodom and Gomorrah. After receiving opportunities to repent and come to the Lord, and they didn't, what did he do? He destroyed the two cities of sin. Why did he destroy them? Because he hated the sin. All that were there were wicked. God lo- hates sin. He loves the sinner. And that is accurate to a degree. The difference is this. God hates sin. He loves the sinner who is following Jesus Christ, who has walked away from their sin, who is going the other direction, not holding on to their sin, not gripping their sin, embracing their sin, not making excuses for their sin so they can continue to live the life they want to live in the world that continues to spit in God's face. And they don't become, that, that way they feel better about themselves. God loves the sinner who's saved by the mercy, by the grace of Jesus Christ, by his sacrifice, by his redemption, and are following Jesus Christ. Not this fake garbage. Not this, well, I put on my name tag, I'm good to go. The ones who have turned away. Psalm 111 verse 7 says, everything God does is good. Everything God does is good. Not sinful, not wicked. Everything God does is good. Job 34.10, so listen to me, you men of understanding. Far be it from God to do evil, from the Almighty to do wrong. See, sin is the total opposite of God. He cannot sin. He will not, he does not look upon sin. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God had to take his eyes off of Jesus Christ when he was on the cross, when he took on all of our sin, because God will not look upon sin. Number two, sin is the opposite of love. We cannot willingly sin and love God. You cannot willingly sin and still love God. And some are like, wait a minute, no, but I I sin. I I I try not to, but I sin. That's not what I said. I, you cannot sin and still love God. You cannot willingly sin. You cannot say, I'm going to make up this excuse. Today, I'm going, to, I'm going to do this anyway, and I'll come back and ask God for forgiveness later. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it because I want to do it because it's fun, and I enjoy it, and it's my kind of thing, and I want to run my life, and I'll come talk to God about it later. You cannot live that life and actually love God. You can't do it. God doesn't reside where sin resides. They're direct opposites. Try, 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 try this. Let me help you out with this. Um, so try this, okay, guys? Um, go to your wife and say, "Hey, babe, you know, you know, I, I've been, I've been, you know, I've been working out of town and stuff. I've been traveling and stuff. I, I, I got, I got this. There's this gal that I've been doing some stuff with, right? And so it's well, we've been doing a lot of stuff together. In fact, I mean, it's been some really good stuff. In fact." Well, I mean, our stuff is pretty good, but, but this was, I mean, but, but babe, here's the thing. I love you, so it's okay. Try doing that one with your wife one time. Actually, let me stop you right now before you even think about it, okay? Because there's that guy that's going to listen for the first time and go, what well, pastor said. It's the same thing. God, I really love you, but, 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 but when I think you're not paying attention... When I walk away, when I come over here, there's this thing I like to do. There's these things I like to do. There's all this stuff I like to do, and it's fun. I really do. It's really good. It's really good. You wouldn't like it, so I'm doing it over here. But I love you, and I'm here. Not going to fly. God does not tolerate sin. He hates sin. Matthew 24, verse 12. Because of the increase of wickedness, this is Jesus talking, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. The love of most will grow cold. We got God. Oh, I love you. But I've been over here playing. I've been over here doing. I've been over here choosing. I've been over here making excuses. And, oh, I, yeah, I still love you. Of course I still love you, God. But I got to go back over here where it's fun and it's exciting. That's what I want to do. 
When sin increases, love decreases. When sin increases, love decreases. It's automatic. It happens. The more we're over here sinning, the less we can love God. We do not, we cannot love sin and love God. You'll love one master and hate the other. You cannot have two masters. As long as we're over here making out with sin, we're telling God he's not good enough for us. And we're letting him know we don't love him. No matter what our mouth says, it's what our heart does that matters. Sin's the opposite of love. Sin, a couple things about sin. Sin is always unhelpful, it's always unreliable, and it's always untruthful. And why, why is that? It's because of number three. Sin is always selfish. Sin is always selfish. James 3.16 For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. Family, there's the the, the root of every sin, every sin, the root is self-centeredness. Me or I, it's self-centered. What's what's the middle letter of sin? I. What's the middle letter of pride? I. What's the little middle letter of crime? I. It's all about I. I. It's not about God. It's about I. Looked up a few other words. Discovered that, well, middle letter of racist, I. Middle letter of sexist, I. Middle letter of chauvinist, I. How about, how about whine? <laughs> but it wasn't about me. I. What about uh, criticize? I. Lying, I. Thief. Envious, deceitful, defiant, merciless, devious, hastiness, suspicion, negligent. I, 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 I. Right in the center of every one of them. And when we make I the center of life, we have anxiety. I. Guilt, fatigue, pessimism, phoniness, hastiness, or hostility, emptiness. I, 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 I. It's all about I. You think God didn't have a hand in writing the English language? Look at all them words. I, right in the center. Right in the center of all them self-centered words. Whenever it's about you, it's sin. When it's about God, it's love, it's righteous, it's right. But when it's about me, what I want, what I desire, what, what's important to me is sin. 2 Timothy 3, one, uh, verse 1 and 2 says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Sound familiar at all? Sound familiar? Scripture tells us that uh, we're to be like Jesus, right? Jesus thought of who? He thought of everyone else. He thought of those that were around him. He laid down his life for us while we were still spitting on him, denying him, crying for him to be crucified. And yet he still laid his life down for us. Why? Because he was worried about us, not I. The first became last. He left the right hand of the Father, the best seat in the house, and he left it because he cared about us and he wanted to redeem us and he wanted to defeat sin. He laid down his life for us and we're called to do the same thing for those around us. We're called to do the same thing. You know, there's an interesting thing about it. When we're sinning, it's all about I and it's okay, it's good as far as I'm concerned. But when we're caught sinning, it's all your fault. It's everybody else's fault. It's good for me when it's I and I'm not caught. It's everyone else's fault when I get caught. Think about it. It happens all the time. It's exactly where it's at. 
Sin is always selfish. Four, sin is unbelief. Sin is unbelief. At the very center of, uh, at the very root, I mean, of sin is, is I don't trust God. At the very root of sin, I don't trust God. Think about it, Adam and Eve in the garden. God made it. It was good. Just not good enough for I. But I want that other tree. But I want the other fruit. But I. I don't trust God. I don't trust his love. I don't trust his compassion. I don't trust his, re- his wisdom. I don't trust his plan. I don't trust God. It's at the center of it. Every bit of it. And Jesus said in John 16, verse 9, the world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. We tend to believe in ourselves instead of believing in Jesus Christ. The world's sin is it doesn't believe in me. We believe in ourselves, we believe in our sin, we believe in what we want. We believe in this world. America's, America's made this very clear. Made it very clear, haven't it? I mean, this country is screaming out all the time, we don't need God. We don't need God. God, who's God? We're God. I'm God. I'm God. That's what this country continues to scream out from the top to the bottom. This country's screaming it out more and more all the time. This country's turned its back on God in so many ways and to such great depths and heights. This country doesn't care about God. Sadder than that, there's a church in this country that's just sat back and said, that's fine with me. It's okay. No, no, that's fine. We'll change the rules. I don't know how we change the rules when the the Bible, the scriptures is supposed to be the foundation of our rule. But the churches in this country have over and over again said, I'm okay with that. That's right, a little more sin. It's just a little sin. It's just a little more sin, a little more sin, a little more sin. If we say it's okay, it's not sin anymore. But if this says it's okay, it's not sin. It's not a church that gets to say it's okay. It's not a pastor. It's not a priest. It's not a bishop. It's not, not anybody. It gets to say it's okay. It's up to the scripture whether it's right or wrong. If this is the infallible truth, and it is, the inerrant truth tells us it's a sin, then it's a sin. I don't care what some guy, whether he's in a pointy hat or he's wearing a cloak and and collar or whether he's up here standing like me or whether he's sitting in a chair. We don't get to say whether it's right or wrong. We don't get to say whether it's sin or not. Scripture tells us that. God tells us that. Unbelief is the world's biggest biggest problem. It's the world's biggest problem right now. And uh, um, out of out of unbelief comes all sin. It's just it's that's the foundation. I don't believe in God. I don't believe God can do this. I don't believe God can do that. I don't believe God's powerful enough. I don't believe His plan's a good plan. We have to remember that once we get, if we, if we get this right, if we get this right, this all falls into place. When we get this right, this falls into place. If we're focused here, this will not be wrong. As long as we're focused here and we're not focused there, we're not focused on sin, I'm not pointing at the cross, I'm pointing at sin. As long as we're not focused on sin, if we stay focused on God, this will fall into place. We'll automatically, when we truly love our God, when we truly live out loving our God, this will be right. Jesus said, um, you'll know my followers by their love. Yet we see all this vile garbage that these Christians, people who claim to be Christians, are posting on Facebook or whatever social media. Facebook's the only one I'm connected to. Whatever, the Twitters and the whatevers, right? Um, it, all the garbage they're posting on there, the vileness they're posting on there, the stuff they're posting on there. Jesus says, well, you'll know my followers by their love, and yet, and yet we have people who claim to be Christians 
who go on there and post things about all kinds of people, and it doesn't matter if they're president or not, doesn't matter whether they're, they're an elected official or not, doesn't matter it's, if whether it's their cousin, their sister, their brother, the neighbor. They post this vile stuff on there. They post, they just, it's just ugly. And yet, Jesus said, you'll know my followers by their love. And he also, I believe Jesus also says this. I love President Obama. I love President Trump. I love President Biden. Why do you say I can only love the ones you want me to love? but I can't love the rest. I went to that cross for all of y'all, not just for you. And yet we act like he went to that cross just for us and those we like. Sin's a big deal. Sin's a really, really big deal. And posting that stuff on there, that's a big deal. It's a very big deal. And God hates sin. And sin is unbelief. And I want to help you understand something. God will never, ever, ever, ever laugh about sin. He will never laugh about sin. It's not funny to him. Sin's a big deal for three reasons. The first one being... Every, t- every time I sin, something dies inside. Every time I sin, something dies inside. Each and every one of us, every time we sin, something dies inside. James 1.15 says, Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Sin and death, they always go together. They're the inseparable twins. When we're sinning, we're dying. When we're sinning, we're dying, folks. They're the twins that are conjoined at the, at the brain and they can't be operated on, cannot be separated. Sin and death, hand in hand. Can't be separated. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Your sin's no different than anyone else's sin. You can't make up the excuse. Well, I didn't, but he said really, really bad things. I only said somewhat bad things. He cheated on his wife three times. I only cheated on mine once. Sin is sin. No one's just better than the other ones. No one's just better than the other ones. In 2020, there were an estimated 1.8 million new cancer cases diagnosed and, and 606,520 cancer deaths in the United States. Um, liver and pancreatic cancers are called the silent killer cancers because by the time you find out you have it, you're going to die. It's too late. One in five survives. One in five, 20% of the people with liver and pancreatic cancer survive their battle. Yet, sin, not cancer, sin is the most lethal silent killer we have in the world today. The most lethal killer known to man is sin. The moment sin entered the world, death started to reign in the world. And the survival rate of a life of sin is zero to everyone. Zero out of everyone. Nobody's going to survive if we're living the life of sin. Proverbs 14, verse 12 says, There is a way that appears right, appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. Every time I sin, something dies inside of me. Every time. I don't care what the church or anybody else calls it. Sin is sin. And it's deadly. And it's deadly to each and every one of us. Second, sin is... Sin may be done in secret, but it is never private. Sin may be done in secret, but it's never private. Numbers 32, verse 23 says, You may be sure that your sin will find you out. You may be sure that your sin will find you out. See, when I was a safety coordinator, when I was a plant foreman, when I was a quality control guy, in all those positions, I had people where 
uh, they had to answer to me. And when something happened, all too often, almost all the time, they lie about it. Sound like I could prove wrong right then and there. But you know what I always told them? Tell me the truth. I, you shoot straight with me right now. We get through this a whole lot easier. But when I find out later, not if, when I find out later, because the truth always, always comes out, when I find out the truth later, it's going to be a lot worse. Look, folks, we ain't hiding it from God either. Sin tells, it, tells on itself. God knows when we sin. We can pretend. We don't have, I try faking out that, well, God doesn't know about that one. Guess what? Yes, he does. You're an idiot for thinking that. And I don't mean to be mean, but I'm just being honest. It's a foolish thought to think that God doesn't know about your sin. We have to remember this, that, that there's nowhere we can hide from sin. I don't, I don't care. You know, we, we're like, oh, God, I, I'll be back and I'll be, I'm just going to hang out over here. And we go and hang out and make out with our mistress over here, right? Our mistress of sin. And we come back, oh, hey, yeah, no, I love you. How's it going? God knows. God knows. Well, I don't have to, if, if I don't confess it, then he won't know about it. Yes, he does. We lie to ourselves. And we just make it that much worse. We just compound, lie after the One thing I found, when people would lie to me on their stories, right? They lie to me. And I'd be like, I'd find out, and I'd be like, well, how about this? And they'd be like, oh, no, that was, that was, that was, I got it on video, man. I mean, come on. Well, that's not me. Uh, that's you. You're right in front of the camera, right? And they lie about it and compound the sin, so to speak. And we do the same exact thing with God. We do the same thing. We lie. We deny. We act like we ignore. Oh, and it's not, if I don't admit it, it didn't happen. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. I'm confused as to why we think this more important for, for us to hide from our fellow person our sin. We do things in secret. And we just don't do it. Well, I, I won't tell anyone at church. I'll go to a different town. I've, I've had pastors tell me how they like to, when they go with their wives on vacation, they like to go a ways away because then they can drink. And no one will know. And they can smoke their cigars. And no one will know. My congregation won't find out. It ain't a thing you guys don't know about me. There's no way I could live that life. And I really struggle with any pastor who sits in a pulpit, stands in a pulpit, serves a pulpit, that has that mentality. I have a huge struggle with that. Who are you lying to? You're lying to all your, she all your flock that you're supposed to be shepherding. You're lying to God. You're lying to yourself. You're lying to your denomination because every year we have to affirm whether we are or we are not following the rules. And one of the rules being we don't drink. Another one being we don't smoke. We don't use tobacco products. And I'm perfectly okay with that. I'm great with that. And when they sign on a dotted line and say, yep, they're good with it, now they're lying to their district. They're lying to their denomination. And lying to God in just another way. We have to remember this. But, but they're hiding it, right? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. I can have me a good time over here. Apparently they can't have a good time sober or without a cigar. I don't get it. Truth of the matter is God knows it all. And one day, our Bible tells us, every knee will bow. Every knee will bow. And know he is Lord. One day we all answer for our sins even the ones we didn't want to acknowledge the ones we pretended weren't sins we'll answer for those as well third one sin has long term damage sin has long term damage it's said that the Eskimos, when they would, when they would wolf hunt, um, they used to take a knife, a very, very, very sharp knife, 
and they would dip it in blood and then let it freeze and they'd dip it in blood and let it freeze and they'd dip it in blood and let it freeze and continue until they had a really big blood popsicle. And then they'd take the knife out and they'd stick it down, they'd set it down, they'd pour water around it and allow it to freeze holding that blade up in the air, that popsicle up in the air. And then they'd go back to their homes. And at night, the wolves would come out and they'd smell that blood and they'd come and they would lick that blood. And they would lick, and they would lick, and they would lick. And what happens when we lick something that's ice cold? You continue to lick it, your tongue goes numb. And their tongue would go numb. And then they'd get to the blade, and suddenly they had this fresh blood that they were tasting. And they would lick, and they would lick, and they would lick. And in the morning, the Eskimos would go out and gather the carcasses as they bled out by licking themselves to death. They licked their knife, the knife, till they died. Satan does the exact same thing with sin. Does the exact same thing. He gets our blood popsicle out there. And he says, check it out. You're only going to get a bit drunk. Lick. Well, you're only going to cheat this one time. Lick. You're only going to look at porn for a little while. Lick. You're only going to gamble and lose money and your whole estate and everything one time. Lick. You're only going to one time. Lick. Another lick. Deuteronomy 29, verse 19 and 20 says this. It says, When such a person hears the words of, his oath, of this oath and they invoke a blessing on themselves, thinking, I will be safe even though I persist in going my own way. In other words, I'll be okay even though I continue to sin and do my own thing. They will bring disaster on the watered land as well as the dry. The Lord will never be willing to forgive them. His wrath and zeal will burn against them. All the curses written in this book will fall on them, and the Lord will blot out their names from under heaven. In other words, when we pretend to be a Christian, when we pretend we say we're a Christian, and we pretend it, we fake it, and then we go and we lick our knife, God will blot our names out of the book of life. Scripture says it. It's not me. I'm just being honest with you. Sin's deadly. Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. God cannot be mocked. And yet we mock him over and over again. It's okay. God, you'll forgive me. I know you'll forgive me. Lord, here's one. Lord, forgive me. I, I know I'm going to have me a good time tonight. Just ask you to forgive me ahead of time. Keep me safe while I go and have a good time. I've heard people say it over and over and over again. I've said it before I actually started following Jesus Christ. Over and over again, God can, God cannot be deceived. He cannot be mocked. He knows what we're thinking before we think it. He knows what we're, before we speak a word, he knows what we're going to say. And he will not be mocked. Sin's a big deal. Sin's a huge deal. So what's the solution to sin? Jesus Christ. Jesus is the solution. He's the one and only solution. He who knew no sin became sin that I might become his righteousness. Small paraphrase there. But we were talking about I, weren't we? So instead of I want to do what I want to do, let's one time say I when it comes to Jesus Christ. He died for me. He took on my sin that I might become his righteousness. He died for you that you, he took on your sin that you might become his righteousness. If we're going to use I, let's use it in the right way. And when he did that, he broke the power of sin. He broke the power of sin. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. He broke the power of sin. He gave us, he sent us the Holy Spirit. And this is a place where the church is really 
boogering it up. And it really makes me mad because the church talks about Jesus. We fail to, re to remind people the Holy Spirit's with us. Jesus came, he saved us, he's our salvation, he redeemed us, and then he sent us a helper. And if the church would encourage our, our flocks to listen to the Holy Spirit, live in the Holy Spirit, we're called to be in the Spirit. We're called to be in the Spirit, not in the world. And if we'll get that, if we'll listen to that, that prompting, that poking you get, you're feeling, that's the Holy Spirit. Now, it might be the devil. Depends on if you've given yourself to the Holy Spirit or not. So are we willing to give ourselves to the Holy Spirit? He gave us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will guide us to live the life that Christ desires for us. The one he went to the cross for us to be able to have. Now, in your notes, I want you to write down a word, four letters, E-V-I-L. E-V-I-L, evil. That's us, you and me, evil in ourselves. When we live in the Spirit, Christ flips the script, and what's his spell? L I. V E, live. Be alive and live in the Spirit. Be alive and live in Jesus Christ. And listen to what He's saying. Those times when you're going to do something, it's like, oh, I just want it, but I just going to be so fun. Oh, I just want it. I just want it. But the reason you have to talk yourself into it is because someone's over here holding you back. That's the Holy Spirit. But it'll be a good time getting drunk. It'll be a great. Oh, there's going to be a great party. There's going to be so many women there. There's going to be so many guys there, depending on who it is. It's going to be a great time. And there's something to hold you, and you've got to talk yourself into it. That's the Holy Spirit saying, come on now. Do you love God, or do you, do you love the world? Are you living in the Spirit, or are you living in the world? The world that's spitting all over my God. That's why I also say oftentimes you hear me say die to self. We need to die to self. Why do we need to die to self? Because if we continue to live in this body, in this form, if we continue to live in human, in my, my humanity, I will continue to live in sin. But when I die to self and I live in the spirit, we flip that script. We have got to die to ourselves. The Satan could come up to me when I'm living for me and I'm living, I'm doing the party life. Satan can come up and get me to sin all day long. But when I'm living in the Spirit, when I'm truly living in the Spirit, all i got to do is go, Satan, guess what? Tug the Spirit, see what he says, because this is his. It's not mine anymore. Romans 6, 6. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might, not be done, might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. When we give it up and we give our lives over to Christ, we give our lives over to the Holy Spirit and we live in the Spirit. The old is dead, the new is here. Raiden, you can come on up here a second if you would, please. I'm going to wrap up with, uh, I want to share something that Pastor Charles Stanley Who's a, who's a pastor that I would, that, that, that I, I value very much. Um, he shares a story. He says, one of my more memorable seminary professors had a practical way of illustrating to us the concept of grace. At the end of his evangelism course, he distributed the exam with, with the caution to read it all the way through. Uh, before, all the way through before I answer, beginning to answer. This caution was written on the exam as well. As we read the test, it became unquestionably clear to each of us that we had not studied nearly enough. The further we read, the worse it became. About halfway through, audible groans could be heard throughout the classroom. On the last page, however, it was noted, you have a choice. You can either complete the exam as given, or sign your name at the bottom, turn it in, and by doing so, receive an A. 
Wow. We were stunned. We, was, he, was he serious? Just sign it and get an A? Slowly, the point dawned on us, and one by one, we turned in our tests and silently filed out, filed out of the room. When I talked with the professor about it afterwards, he shared some of the reactions he had received through the years. Some students began to take the exam without reading it all the way through, and they would, they would sweat it out for the entire two hours before reaching the last page. Others read the first two pages, became angry, turned into test blank, and stormed out of the room without signing it. They never realized what was available, and as a, as a result, they lost out completely. In fact, one particular student, I remind you, these are seminary students, one particular student read the entire test, including a note at the end, but decided to take the exam anyway. He told me later he didn't want any gifts. He wanted to earn his grade, and he did. He got a C+, plus, but could have easily had an A. The story illustrates many people's reaction to God's, situation, uh, God's solution to sin. Some people look at God's standard, moral and ethical perfection, and throw their hands up and surrender. Why even try, they tell themselves. I could never live up to all that stuff. Others are like the student who read the test through and was aware of the professor's offer, but took the test anyway. Unwilling to simply receive God's gift of forgiveness, they set about to rack up enough points with God to earn it. But God's grace truly is like the professor's offer. It may seem unbelievable, but if we accept it, then, like the stunned students who accepted the professor's offer, we too will discover that, yes, God's grace truly is free. All we have to do is accept it. Sin's our greatest problem. Jesus is our only solution. Do you know Jesus? Do you really know Jesus? See, there's, there's people here that, that uh, um, have, have given their life to Christ, or so they said, yet you don't see a difference in their life. They continue with the same lies. They continue with the same addictions. They continue with the same struggles. They continue with the same, the same, the same. But they never really, truly have given their lives to Christ. Today, I want to offer you that chance. I want to encourage you to take that opportunity to give your life to Christ, to really give your life over to Christ, to let the Holy Spirit truly lead you, to sign your name, and receive the gift that Jesus died for. Receive the gift that God sent his one and only son as a sacrifice for. I don't care where you're at. You know where you're at. God knows where you're at. God loves you. He wants you to come to him. He wants you to receive that free gift. He wants you to, he wants you to receive that A because you cannot even earn enough points for a C+. Plus. We cannot earn points. Our Bible tells us there's no earning your way into heaven. There's no earning your way into God's heart. There's no earning your way into eternal life with God. There's no way earning that. We can't get the points, folks. All we can do is sign on the line and accept the free gift that Jesus Christ offers us. Please join me as we go to the Lord. Dear Lord, thank you so very much. Lord, it gets a little close in here sometimes. Father, I don't apologize. I will not apologize. If I apologize, it would mean that I don't care about the souls in this room. It would mean I don't, I don't care because, you know, I would just rather not hurt feelings. I'd rather not make anyone look deep into themselves. I'd, I'd, I'd rather, you know, it means that I would rather not have them evaluate what they're doing in life, where they're at, where they're going, who they're walking with, who they're in love with, if they're cheating on you or not. Father, I just, I don't apologize. I just ask that wherever everyone's at, here in the house, online, wherever they're at, that Lord, that, that, that they, they'd be willing to just sign on the line the party isn't that great. The eternal one is. The earthly one's not. 
the eternal or the, the earthly buzz isn't that great. The earthly affection isn't that great. The earthly wants, the eyes aren't great. However, Father, what you have to offer us, that eternal life with you, with your Son who came and sacrificed himself for us, that eternal life with your Holy Spirit who's trying ever so hard to get us to take the right path. We can celebrate with you, all of you, one day, if we'll just now just give ourselves away. So, Father, I ask that, that you would hear the prayers, that you'd hear the prayers that are here asking you right now, Father, Father, please forgive me. Forgive me because, man, I've been, I've been cheating on you. I've been cheating on you. Father, I, I, I've been acting like I was a Christian, but I ain't been a Christian. Father, I was at one point, but I'm not right now. I've walked away. Father, please receive me back. Please forgive me. Please lead me. Please guide me. Father, I want to live within your spirit. I want to, I, I now declare that I will die to self. I no longer want to live the life that I have, that I have chosen, that I'm living in, in sin. Rather, I want the life that you desire for me. And Father, from this day on, I promise, I pledge, I vow myself to you to hear your word, to hear your spirit, to follow the path that you lay out before me, to listen to the promptings, to listen to the love overflowing. Father, I ask that you would hear each and every one of these prayers, dear Lord. And Lord, that you would overwhelm them, overwhelm them with your love, just pour it over. Let the Spirit pour over. Let the, just let the Spirit just wash us clean. Father, that we would not want, want to live in that sin anymore. And Father, as we leave here, that we would be willing to share that same Spirit, that same message with those around us when we go and we're to the church where we belong, where the church belongs. It's not about a stinking building. It's about a body your body, your bride, and help us to go out and be the bride that you call us to be. And I just pray these things in your loving Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, if you're starting over, or maybe starting for the first time, 